Amazing, cool. We've had, a, we have an excellent turnout at the moment. Um, my name is Malati Weissen. I'm a 19 year old full time change maker. Very happy to be hosting this session tonight with you all on Plastic Free July and Beyond with the question What if we could live in a single use plastic free world? Tonight I will be joined with an incredible amount of youth led frontline activists who are day in, day out, dedicating everything they have to ensuring that we are actually moving towards that single-use plastic-free world. In a moment, you'll be hearing from them. We'll be having an introduction. I did just have a list here that I had to go through um, on etiquette of how we'd like to run these Utopia talks. For those of you that need a little bit of background, uh, Utopia is our new project. It's a community-centric platform with learning at its core. We really believe in creating the space for young change makers to come together and use peer-to-peer -peer learning or peer-to-peer -peer programs as a place for us to feel empowered, learn from each other, and go back out there in the real world and make change happen. So this is our first ever Utopia Talks on the topic of plastic pollution. Before we get started, I just wanted to ask everybody to please remember to stay on mute, just so that we can have a facilitated discussion and conversation hearing our speakers for the Utopia Talks. Um, aside from that, if you're not a panelist or a speaker, please also consider turning off your video, again, for better communications, uh, as this is a recorded session as well. In the meantime, I encourage every one of you to please join us in the comment section and ask us your questions. When we're in the discussions, when we're having a conversation and you feel like you wanna ask a question or you didn't understand something, I encourage you to use the chat box and write us your questions. We will have a opportunity at the end of this to invite participants to unmute themselves, unvideo themselves, show their faces and ask our beautiful panelists a question. And the last point is to please pin the videos of our speakers for you to be able to see them throughout the panel discussion. Amazing, I'm so exciting. And um, without further ado, I think uh, that was enough of an introduction uh, on my end where this is our first ever Utopia Talks. I feel like I've talked too much. You saw the video beforehand of me speaking. So I will stop it there and introduce to you one by one the three incredible young change makers that we have joining us today for our first session. And why don't we start off with the only male as part of this panel, Sam Bench Gibbs. Hey guys, how's it going? Melati, thank you so much for having me on your first Utopia talk. My name is Sam Bench I'm 23, and I grew up in Bali in Indonesia, you know, beautiful paradise. And with my older brother, Gary, my older sister, Kelly, we founded an organization called Make a Change, which is an environmental media. And, you know, always seeing plastic pollution wash off on the shores of Bali, we realized that this was a huge problem. And so we started cleaning it up at a very young age when I was 12, my brother was 14, and then quickly realized that cleanups weren't enough. And so we switched our efforts to visual storytelling and making videos and then education. And we also love adventure. And so we combined our passion of adventure and the environment. We've kayaked down the world's most polluted river, the Chitar River in Indonesia on 300 bottles, plastic bottles that we built, or kayaks that we built. And most recently, I just finished running 5,000 kilometers from New York City all the way to Los Angeles on shoes made out of 11 plastic bottles to raise awareness about plastic pollution. And so I'm honored to be here and thanks for having me, Malati. How incredible is that? Ladies, I'm sorry, but he is taken by a lovely, uh, friend, Sam is an incredible individual. He ran across an entire country to raise awareness about plastic pollution. I mean, this is the level of dedication we are joining together with tonight. Another person that I would like to introduce you, our second panelist, Sydney Steenland from the Sea Monkey Project, and she will be joining us from above the ocean on her boat. Sydney, can I ask you to unmute yourself and introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, everyone. I'm Sydney from the Sea Monkey Project, and I'm 15. And my family and I, so my mom, my dad, my brother and I, we have been living and traveling on a sailboat since 2011. And we came from Brisbane, Australia. And as we sailed, and we saw places that tourists don't always get to see, very beautiful, pristine places were not actually that pristine. 
So we saw plastic pollution everywhere we went. And when we reached Malaysia, we decided to create a project and we got the Sea Monkey Project that focuses on ocean pollution solutions and education. So we upcycle a lot of materials and recycle and we do a lot of education. So I'm right now on my boat in Malaysia. So it's pretty interesting. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I, I, Sydney, I grew up on a, a boat as well. Not the whole time, but definitely on and off and that connection to the environment. I think through almost all these different introductions that we've had of our speakers, you're going to be realizing that there is a common theme here. And it is that connection, that beautiful, strong love that we have for the environment around us. And so without further ado, I'm introducing the last panelist that will be joining us tonight, a little bit closer to home in the same country, just on the island next door, Ibu Tenya. Please introduce yourself from Divers Clean Action. Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me, Melati. Uh, my name is Tenya. I think I'm the eldest one here. I'm 25 years old. I started my community named Divers Clean Action when I was 19 years old. I was back then a university student. And as a scuba diver, uh, I realized there are a lot of potential solutions amidst all of the problems that we face under the water regarding of methane pollution. So our community now already become a legitimate foundation. We have 10 staffs and volunteers all across Southeast Asian countries. And what we're doing are uh, citizen science. We do a research, we do community development program, campaign, and also workshop. I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tenya. So there you have it. We have a little bit of adventure. We have a little bit of the science and we have all strongly the passion for education, systemic change, individual change. We have it all joining us tonight for the first ever Youthopia Talks. Please take a moment behind your screens to do a little clap for our speakers. <laughs> Amazing. All right, so virtual conferences are a little bit, um, well, different. Let's just say different. It allows us to connect with all of you joining in right now live through your own living rooms, through your own office spaces at home. We again, thank you so much for joining and tuning in. I would like to kind of warm up our speakers a little bit. We have about four different, oh no, three, including me and Tanya, three countries going live. So to warm us all up as speakers, who by the way, we've all briefly just reconnected. I'm going to ask you a warm up question. Okay. Are you ready? What are the two plastic items you wish never existed and why? Who wants to take that hot potato first? Me, I think. Go. Um, sachets, the single use plastic packaging one, and also straws. Okay, perfect choice. And why? So because I really found a lot of single use straws when I do clean up diving and on beach, and then it's so unuseful because we can actually still drink without straws. And other than that, about single-use sachets, it's actually we are buying the packaging itself rather than the products, and it cannot be recycled 100% in Indonesia. So it needs to be gone. I agree with you. It needs to be gone. Okay, and we'll talk about alternatives. So for those of you watching and thinking, okay, what a weird question to start off. Well, at the heart of it, we're anti-plastic, single-use plastic activists. So popping over the question to Sam, what two items do you wish never existed and why? I think that the first one that comes to mind is definitely the plastic bag. And I know that you're an expert at that for banning plastic bags in Bali. But here in the US, I live in New York and it costs about a cent to make a plastic bag and four cents to make a paper bag. And so it's so convenient, but it also just is so destructive to the planet. It's very hard to recycle. And the second item I think would be single use styrofoam containers because styrofoam is just not recyclable and it's so damaging to our planet. So there you go, plastic bags and styrofoam containers. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. So we have straws, sachets, bags, and styrofoam. Now think a little bit, before we ask Sydney what her questions are, think a little bit, do you use these items at home? Do you find yourself using these items and why? The next question is, could you replace them? We'll talk about this a little bit more, but just for the participants and those of you watching at home, have a good think about that as we go to Sydney. What are two items that you wish never existed? Um, very close to what Sam said. I definitely don't like plastic bags because they are, they're so easy to replace and seriously damaging on the environment. And 
like food containers, whether it be, well, coffee cups or the clamshell takeaway containers, because some, most of the time, well, not most of the time, sometimes it's actually made out of polystyrene and that is a very hard plastic to be recycled. And lots, this just, it's so easy to replace it, but it's so hard to get people to do it. But it's, it's a nasty one. I, we see it so much in Malaysia. So it really gets me angry. <laughs> I already love the channel that we're on with addressing single-use plastics. And I love also why your reasons were because simply either one, we really don't need to use it. Or secondly, there have been more eco-friendly alternatives to those harmful single-use plastics. So thank you for that warm-up question. I hope now we can dive in a little bit more to actually your stories of what made, what was your aha moment? I don't really have a better way of explaining it, but think back to, was there one specific moment where you really felt like this was your mission, this was your path, or what, what's your story? Where did it start? Tanya, can we start with you? I think my aha moment is actually already um, I got since I was uh, nine years old because back then in 2003, I used to live in one of the island outer part of Jakarta. The name of the island is Pramuka Island, where the population is only 1,000 back then. Now it's already 2,000 people living there. And I used to witness by myself that the community is dumping their waste to the ocean because they think it is helping reclamation of the sand or the erosion or stuff like that. And back then, I think that it's normal thing. And I think that the solution is far from what I can reach. But then I realized as a scuba diver back then, since a child, and then I grew uh, to junior high, high school, and then university, I realized that actually the theory is there on implementing the solid waste management system that is more proper on the islands. And of course, the policy that needs to be done as well. And after I realized that on my university, then I made a community because I cannot simply find another community that works specifically on the small islands area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you were really from that grassroots level, which I particularly love and also relate with my work as an activist as, as well. And we're going to talk about that. So again, tune in for the viewers. Our next, our, our, one of our questions that we will address is about how you did that. You know, Sam, you also have such an interesting past, obviously, growing up here on the same island of Bali. You experienced that face-to-face -face confrontation with the problem. But your question I'm going to ask is a little bit different. What made you decide to actually run across America for plastic pollution or to raise awareness about plastic pollution? What was your aha moment for that? You know, like similar to you growing up in Bali, seeing the beaches get devastated throughout the years, like you would clean it up one day, the, the very next day, all of that trash comes right back. And then this is like not necessarily answering your question, but going down the Chitang River, which is the most polluted river in the world, seeing that there's you know, an estimated 20 million people that rely on its water to live and seeing how polluted that river was. Like with Gary, my brother, we really realized that no idea is crazy enough. And so thinking about what I could do here in the US to raise awareness, I was like, why don't I try to come up with the craziest concepts I can think about to raise awareness about this cause? And to me, it was running from one ocean to the other ocean 5,000 kilometers apart, bringing the ocean to these landlocked communities, because out of the 13 US states that I ran through, 11 don't have access to oceans. So they don't necessarily understand the impacts that plastic pollution can have on the environment. I think there's also a huge lack of education. And so for me, doing this run on shoes made out of 11 plastic bottles was a good way of getting the message out there. And then along the way, meeting with schools, meeting with politicians to try to raise some awareness and have these conversations. Yeah, just coming up with the craziest concept to get people's attention. And I think sometimes that's really what you need to do. Exactly. And I think, you know, it's, it's, I think the normal way of doing things doesn't work anymore. So we do need more crazy ideas, more out of the box thinking. So I, I admire you and I salute you. I think you said, yeah, one, it was a good idea. I mean, it's a fantastic idea. You ran across a whole country. So congratulations and chapeau for doing that. I think one of the things, just following through what you were saying before we moved to Sydney, what was one of the most satisfying things that you saw come out of that run that you did? One of the most rewarding things by far is the response that people have had when I was running and I'd speak to schools and sometimes I'd be in front of 700 school kids and you know, the kids are so fidgety, they're all talking to each other. 
And there's this random guy standing in front of them in like a big gymnasium and they have no idea who I am or what I'm about to say. And even if I say I'm running across the country, you know, to 10 to 10 to 12 year old kids, they don't understand what that means. It's like Forrest Gump. They haven't necessarily seen that movie yet. Um, and so when you show them a picture of Bali or any beach that's incredibly polluted, they automatically stop talking and you see a, a sprinkle in their eyes and they're so fascinated. And so actually a lot of these schools that I spoke to um, have now completely banned styrofoam in their cafeterias. A few of the businesses I talked to are now single use plastic free. A big part of my run was trying to convince cities and municipalities to go plastic free, kind of like what you did in Bali. Realize that here in the US that's a lot more difficult because of just the, the complexity of the, the political system here in the US. But yeah, seeing those schools go plastic free was made this whole run worth it. That's awesome, Sam. No, that's, uh, you know, again, it's bringing those experiences to people that aren't necessarily exposed to it. Same thing with Tenya was doing by, you know, really that grassroots effort. Um, and we go from one adventure, which was Sam and his journey across one country to raise awareness about plastic pollution, all the way to Sydney on a different adventure. Sydney lives on a boat and travels around raising awareness with her project, the Sea Monkey Project. Sydney, tell us what was your aha moment? I don't think I really did have an aha moment. It was like, so like ever for my entire life, the ocean has just been my home. And I guess as we sailed and I just, you know, was enjoying boat life. But then when we reached more polluted countries, it just sort of, I grew, I grew up with it. And my parents, they were teaching me it as I got older. And the project was started by my father and he brought me along who, and he, taught me everything and we worked on these recycling machines where we recycle our plastic together and eventually I'm just like as I got older and I had all this information with me I'm like oh man this this pollution thing is like really bad like it, it just eventually twigged to me that it affects people's lives like it doesn't just affect animals which I'm you know we're all very fond of it affects a lot of humans that are just not aware of it. And, you know, kids are getting sick from it and just, it's just destroying everything. So I was like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I, I grew up with it. I want to protect my home. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. I, I can, I can relate to that. It's, it's hard sometimes to pin down a specific moment where you're like, okay, this is it, especially because all of us started at such a young age. But then again, that's what Utopia is all about, bringing young change makers together and navigating the space of how do we actually get change happening. So that leads me to my next question. All of these watchers and viewers joining us from their living room, you know Utopia is a platform that can give you those change-making skills. And here we're presented with an incredible real life examples of how they've really made a difference in their community through one way or another. How would you explain or what do you think was the first step for you to really enable your ideas into reality? What would you say are the, the first couple of things that you had to do? Sydney, do you wanna start? We first began our project just making little YouTube videos and stuff. And it was mostly curated by my mom. And I'm very glad that she uh, asked me to do this. And I was very happy to do it. And it was very good information. But then as I went on, I started telling people, hey, you shouldn't be using this. It's very bad. And there's lots of alternatives. And then I just I went on to be more in depth in the project. So I guess my very first thing I did was just educating other people. Educating, I guess also educating yourself and then educating other people, right? Because you said you were having yeah. experience and then seeing how you could enable and share that power with others. Kenya, what about you? You are the one, you know, that really outlined how grassroots you were because you saw it wasn't happening. How did you mobilize a community that, for example, would not necessarily have the means nor the interest to get involved in the plastic pollution space? What were some of the first things you did to get started? I think it's as simple as writing things down because uh, for myself, as a disorganized person, I have a lot of ideas on my mind and also a lot of concerns that I am facing currently about the environment, back then about what to do, and I think this is the best idea, and then why uh, that person doesn't want to follow, stuff like that. But when we write that down, and then we find a mind map of uh, the system itself, it all kind of makes sense, and then I can decide what is my first step 
on achieving my goals, my bigger goals. So, and also realizing that we cannot do everything at one time and it's okay to say no, because sometimes as a young age, when I started my community, I feel like I want to do everything at the same time, right? Uh, and I feel like there's a lot of solutions that needs to be done. But if we are focused on what the goal that we already aim, at the beginning after we do the mind map, I think it's much more faster to achieve the impact that we targeted. Oh my God, yes. A little bit of snaps, please, everybody, for that. That was music to my ears. I think gaining clarity and understanding your role in making change and also being a little bit realistic in it. So for example, what you what you're giving Tanya is exactly how the story of, of me and my sister started. You know, we even, we did a whole brainstorming session. We kind of create, came up with a, a roadmap, understanding and doing your local homework as well. Who's already involved, who's not involved, who wants to be, who doesn't. And then I love also what you were saying of, you know, not doing everything at once. Right. That is sometimes it's it's a lot. And I can see Sydney, you know, nodding as well. It's something that we take as, as young change makers a lot on our shoulders and we want to go out there and do all. But to actually create positive impact, it's so it's so much more useful and more impactful if you are focused on really putting your energy and your time into something that's tangible, realistic. So awesome. I'm learning so many new things. I hope all of you watching are feeling as excited as, as I am. Sam, you're the last one. What was some of your first things that you had to learn in order to get started? As a 12 year old kid living in Bali, um, realizing that this problem is huge and it's not gonna, I'm not gonna be the one to solve it, but I do have two hands and I can clean my beaches. That was my first realization. But then in order to grow, and try to make a bigger impact, something that we realized with Gary and with Kelly is that you really can't do it alone and you have to find allies and you have to collaborate and you have to you know, work alongside other organizations in your area to really make a difference. And then what we did with Gary and that what really started our passion for media and for storytelling is that we can spread the message so easily through social media and so finding ways that you can really grow and spread your message, spread, spread, your, spread the word. And then also <laughs> two more things. The first is that we all know that this is a problem. And so trying to come up with a way to be or to spread the message in a positive light. I think right now everybody knows that plastic pollution is a real problem. And so trying to relay that message with solutions, trying to share stories of hope and change. And then Finally, the last one, I would say to be persistent and to never give up and just to continue fighting day in and day out. I think that will, well, that will uh, cause some change. <laughs> Definitely. And Sam, you know, it was, you know, you were giving one good tip after the other. And I was like, okay, so here I see, you know, we, we could potentially come up together and all write a book about all these things that you need to know as a foundational kind of skills, tips, tools, and then, you know, that's something that we have experienced on the front line. So what we as a recap have heard on this question of how to get started, I think it's good to educate yourself before you even try and go out there to, to educate others. Really feel confident in yourself on the topic. Make sure you can stand on your own two feet and defend an idea, but also be ready to come with a solution. I think it works a lot better if you come prepared with, you know what, if I want to say no to plastic bags, here are the alternatives that we offer or show real life examples around the world. You can start immediately posting YouTube channels, uh, YouTube videos, like Sydney was saying, uh, Tenya was saying to write things down, come up with your actual plan. And then Sam as well with his history and his story, build your team and find your unique plug in to the problem and also not address it as a problem, but more as an opportunity, right? I think that's something that, that young people in general do very well. So, you know, this was sort of where we, we uh, talked about all the positive things that you can do to get started, but oftentimes it's not that easy especially when we're going up a billion dollar industry such as plastic pollution. It's a lot of work. Um, Tanya, we can start with you. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges that we're facing that prevent us from actually moving away from plastics and moving to our alternatives? Yeah, I think I, I already write down like three items that really out there and really has to be find a solution on. The first one is the lack or the minimum uh, commitment from the government and private sector because 
sometimes they say that okay they want to end the plastic pollution but at some point if we see on the upstream they are still incentivizing the virgin plastics which made the recycled plastic price cannot be much more cheaper and so not many more industry can support the circular economy efforts or giving an alternative solution because at the upstreams it is not done well it is not stopped you know that's the first one and then also about that some uh, issues that we found the transportation of single use plastic alternative solutions such as refillable soaps refillable daily necessities cannot be accessible everywhere maybe it's only on cities big cities but my friends on 17,000 small islands in my country alone cannot access that product so they are still depending on that single use of plastics not only bags but also sachets and the second point is maybe the limited sustainable and nature jobs because sometimes youth like me especially coming from a grassroots that not too privileged we sometimes need to prioritize my family at income or economy so we cannot choose the job not freely as the other that have privilege so actually the government and also the private sector needs to give more jobs, the natural jobs, to give solutions on alternative solutions of plastic waste. And then the third one is the low demand from the community on getting the alternative solutions of the single-use plastic. Because sometimes the private sector thinks the demand is not there, so they are not supplying it. So it's not going to work if it's only Malati, Sam, and then uh, us here uh, demanding that, that we need all of the community all around the globe demanding the same uh, solutions. I think that's all. Oh, but you hit it right on the dot. I think, you know, you came prepared. I think the private and government, uh, private sector and government definitely need to hear us out. We do see examples of companies that are trying to move in the right direction, but what we often are limited to or what we often hear are goals and, you know, uh, intentions, but it is definitely the implementation to seeing the change happen. And that means a lot more accessibility, which is what you were saying, Tanya, accessibility to opportunity, um, not only to say no to single-use plastic, but actually dispose of the waste that you're already using enough to be able to start looking towards an alternative path. So, I don't know, what it's, I still in this space for the last seven years, it's, you think it's a chicken and an egg situation, but at one point, I do think the leaders that have the power are not using it to its full potential. And that's what I must agree with you, Tanya, is uh, one of the most disappointing challenges that we're facing or barriers that we're facing that prevents us from change. At the end of the day, it's not enough that, you know, just us panelists are involved in it, but there's a bigger movement, and especially coming from the young generation, which makes up a huge amount of future consumers so private sector, government, industry leaders, if you're listening into the recording, we want change to happen. Now, Sam, I'm going to head over to you. What, what have you experienced as some of the challenges throughout your work on why we're not changing faster? I would say, unfortunately, it seems harder to put words into action than it should be. And Tanya really hit... Um, I mean, right on the head there by, by talking about industry leaders and, and government sectors, but even as individuals, I think so many of my friends in my close circle have told me I'm going to stop using single-use plastics. But then when you actually look at their consumption habits and you actually spend a day with them, you realize that they actually have not changed anything. And so it's unfortunately a lot harder, again, to put words into action. And so, you know, continue raising awareness, continue highlighting education is one of the main points of to solve this crisis and so i think one thing that would be really interesting and should be done is really making climate action and plastic pollution a topic of discussion in schools which is clearly not being done enough but i think that's really the biggest point where things have been where i find things to be a little harder is so many people say these things but then they don't actually do them Yep. Well, you know, that's, I think, uh, whether we see it and compare it to New Year's resolutions, something as simple as saying you're going to work out every day of the week. I know, Sam, you do, 
but you know that some some in comparison right it is a change in mindset that we need to have but i also think it's a systemic change that needs to happen we need to see more of the places that we're going to obviously pre covid but think about you know even now when you're ordering something online or when you're um you know seeing a new business pop up are they adapting to the more sustainable regulations or not and what i mean is that are they as business leaders as industry leaders changing by avoiding or eliminating single use plastics i mean it's 2020 at one point you also have to evolve beyond just education and 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 again like what we were all agreeing before leaving it up to the kids to clean up the mess we don't have the time for that right so sydney tell us a little bit about your approach because you also you're uh, you know you don't you have the ocean as your home you're meeting a lot of different cultures and and people backgrounds cultures what are some of the challenges that you've seen or come up against whether that's through mindset or even other ones that you're interacting with i definitely agree with uh, sam and tanya but i mean i'm kind of like one of those um i'm gonna say 60s or 70s hippies that are very suspicious of the government and stuff even though it's so much more known these days of what people are up to but i mean after seeing so many different cultures in such a short period of time I must say. I'm going to say Australia is very good at hiding everything. So everyone in Australia they just they think that they're so they think that everything that they're doing for the environment is amazing and that they're doing so much when really the only thing that they're doing is using their recycling bins which is great but the government still is not doing a good job at their recycling. It's all behind the scenes and it's like conservation work. It's it's mostly behind the scenes. It's not much of it is actually seen. But then, so yeah, Australia is very good at hiding everything and everyone's just quite, you know, living in the clouds and stuff. But then in Asia, people are just really clueless. Like I'm not blaming anyone, but it's just, I might say the government, I'll say the culture, I'll just say how people have grown up these days. Everyone's just clueless. Like we got in a grab, we got an Uber, car a couple months ago and this guy was asking us about what are we doing in Asia and we're telling him about our project and then he says to us he's like oh so the plastic pollution thing is real huh it's pretty bad isn't it I'm like what you don't see it on the road that we are driving right. on right now mm -hmm. and it was insane and I think the biggest thing here you know we've so we started out doing recycling but we realized that that is definitely not going to be the answer it needs to be education because people are just quite just clueless so and to educate people is a very rewarding thing and it really it you just need education then it's like oh okay you're good you can go out in the world and do your own research and then start making change in the world like just a little education can change anyone yeah yeah i think it's educations and persistence of implementation right i think we've had a couple of examples here throughout indonesia of you know single use plastics being banned recently where tenya is in, uh, in in jakarta we have the plastic bag ban here in bali we have last year the regulation and paper implemented however the translation of that is a whole other uh, step or journey of the way right but you know i also think that i want to acknowledge the time that we're in right sitting here on a Thursday evening at uh, on Zoom with each other all around the world, having this discussion. But COVID-19 happened. The world kind of hit pause, had to restructure everything you can imagine from the way we learn, the way we eat, the way we uh, study, uh, work from home, all of that. Do you think or do you fall into the narrative where you see people who have not previously done more conscious or eco-conscious uh, studies or learnings, do you feel like some of your friend groups or just people you're surrounded with, companies even that are reaching out, do you see them doing a sustainable shift or not? All right. Um, yeah, well, my friends, uh, definitely. I mean, I know there's one girl in this uh, chat right now. I, I met her very recently and I don't know how much she knew about plastic pollution before, but she's definitely gone a good distance since I met her and I'm pretty good friends with her now. And yeah, I have friends like all over the world and even I didn't, I haven't done much to actually educate them, but even just seeing what we're doing and then them going and looking at what other people are doing 
they are then inspired to keep going. And I would say, I would definitely say that about my friends. They're amazing, but I wouldn't say the same about companies. They're they're very big hypocrites, I'll say. We have partnered with, well, not partnered, we've collaborated with a lot of companies that they basically, what we see is that they want to do this, uh, like recycling, just for the image. They don't actually keep going and they don't Mm -hmm. actually keep doing stuff. And that's one of my life's greatest disappointments is seeing how it it doesn't end up happening. So it's very temporary. And, you know, I feel old saying this, but you are one of the younger ones on our panels, you know, and we've all been through it and we're still all in it. It's like, I've been in this for the last seven years. It's a long process, but we also need to acknowledge that we need everybody, all levels of society, no matter who you are, what industry you're in, we need everybody to make change happen. And it takes longer for others than than not. But to go back to, to the question of, you know, do we see an individual slash company industry shift sam and tenya both of you are in cities right big cities with people doing lots of online shopping or god knows what but they're confronted or confined to their own homes and their own living rooms where they see suddenly their trash bin piling up with more plastic has that created some sort of trigger is covid19 accelerating the change we want to see yeah i think that covid19 is a great point of discussion when it comes to plastic you know, there's that whole debate of, is it safe to use single use plastics? And I think with the study that just came out, I think it was two weeks ago, um, with 120 scientists coming together saying that single use plastic is in fact safe to use, or sorry, um, reusable uh, is in fact safe to use. It really, I think until now, since the beginning of COVID, people thought that I'm just gonna use single use plastic items and not use reusables because it's safer. But now, you know, we're finally realizing that that's not the case. But I think people are starting to catch on slowly. You know, industries, maybe not as fast, but individuals are. And I think what it comes down to is having the accessibility of the reusable products. And unfortunately, like Tanya said earlier, in Indonesia, that's just not the case. Um, But here in New York, I mean, there's a few zero waste stores. There's a few bulk options. A few organizations are definitely starting to, to... accept this change like sydney said not enough but i mean the few companies that come to mind are like patagonia adidas you know who have actually made pledges to um, have all of their items be you know zero waste or 100 percent cotton or whatever it is by a certain date and i think that shows promising change but unfortunately just not enough but i mean it does come down to us to continue motivating these companies motivating these individuals um, but yeah, COVID, like you said, is, a de- is definitely one that there's just so much trash that we're accumulating. And I think, you know, I've moved to New York a month and a half ago, wake up every morning really early and the garbage trucks come and pick up all the trash at like 6 a.m. You walk on the streets of New York and it is so scary to see how much trash there's on the streets every single day. And I mean, that's a huge wake up call. I wish everyone could wake up at 6 a.m. just to see that because, you know, that's why they do it so early because everyone wakes up later and then they go about their day and there's no trash. But um, yeah, COVID-19 has definitely has definitely hit the plastic industry quite hard. Yeah. Interesting perspective, Sam. Tenya, what about you? How's the big city of Jakarta? As like what Melati said earlier, that Jakarta is now officially bending plastic bags, uh, not only in malls and restaurants, but also on traditional markets. So it's actually a big policy, especially uh, Jakarta became the second Southeast Asian capital city uh, that implement that. So that's big. During the implementation, especially given the COVID situation, the number is actually increasing because of the delivery situation. Uh, it's actually increasing 40% until 60%, not only about food delivery, but also shopping delivery, online shopping. And 96% out of those packaging are single-use plastics. Regarding the plastic bags and then the cable ties and then tapes and all of the unimportant uh, plastics, which is scary. And only... I I believe it's only 50% out of the community in Jakarta realized that it is not actually helping to avoid the COVID. 
it's actually not more hygiene. The plastic bag is actually can contain virus up to three days. So it's actually something that we are trying to advocate more and more to the private sectors and also the government. And they need us as the community to monitor that, to make sure that the policy is being implemented. And other than that, I think this is a new hope as well, because as what the others say, the collaboration is key. And I think this is a momentum because now Indonesia has already 23 cities that implement the single use plastic ban. And currently we already gather more than 100 communities from all of the provinces to demand, not uh, doing March on offline, but we're doing March on online. And we believe that we need to demand more and more actions. But regarding to the private sectors moving towards a better solutions or not, about the alternative solutions on single-use plastic bags and single-use sachets, it's actually really slow because currently we have box store shops on the islands. It's actually not supported by the private sectors because they have a lot of reasons and a lot of like uh, excuses. Um, so we are now uh, working on providing alternative solution on single-use plastic bags and single-use sachets, but it's all home local ground of businesses rather than big ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, Tanya, when you were talking about all the good news, I was like, yes, yes, yes. And then you brought it back down to the realness of how difficult it is. But again, there's a lot of layers. But when we gain that clarity, it, it helps us a lot. And you actually touched on something that I want to kind of lean towards the towards a, um, before we open it for questions and answers. So those of you that are still with us, thank you so much. If you have a question, write it down. Our team will be in touch with you. If you're opening your camera and you're unmuting, uh, you can actually address our panelists. Uh, we're trying to be as engaging and interactive as possible for our Utopia talks. Kenya, you mentioned alternatives. So. I think uh, here was one question asked by an audience beforehand when, when filling out the form. What are your thoughts on the alternatives that are currently out there? Time is, is running out, I know. Sam, Tenya, Sydney, can you say sort of one plastic item that you used to use and now absolutely do not use and what is that replacement? What is the alternative you're using at the moment? Sam, we can start with you and then we'll go to Sydney and then Tenya. It's hard to say, but there's so many, so many of them. Uh, the, the one that really is a bummer that people use, like I said, is the plastic bag. And it is so easy to get a reusable bag. But then, like, I think that something that is really important to do is doing a trash audit. And so going around your house, her room, and seeing, you know, how many plastic items you use in the bathroom, how many single-use plastic items you use in the kitchen, in your bedroom. And that, that will really give you an idea of, how much plastic you're using and especially what items are the plastic items that you're using the most. Yeah, plastic bags for me is definitely the big one. Okay, and did you say your alternative? Yeah. A reusable bag. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> like well you guys, bag or... a reusable bag, otherwise you can get really creative and DIY it. There's a lot of fun ways yeah. to do it. If you're looking for cool purposeful TikTok videos, I'm sure there's a lot out there, um, but yeah, Plastic bag, you can lose that one overnight, but it is uh, just getting in the habit. So again, we're looking at individual actions. This is not at all towards the standard of what industries are doing. Tanya, what is something that you've personally done avoiding single-use plastic? Um, no, I think changing everything into refillable options, refillable products, because not every people has the accessibility to the nearby box store or a refill shops. But I think uh, the alternative solutions that I implemented in my own house, which have 15 people living inside or in my islands, which not everybody has the privilege on buying bigger things or uh, recyclable things. We can actually buy like a big jar of uh, soaps or shampoos and then we can divide it and it is actually more cheaper and also it's more eco-friendly. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Sydney, what about you? It kind of varies to each country. So I, I'm very uptight about plastic bottles, but no matter if it's water or if it's just a soda drink, I've, I haven't used one in like years now. But probably the last time I did use one was when I was in uh, Myanmar. And the thing about going to countries like that is they don't have filtered water unless it's in like a very special, very fancy filter or it's in a plastic bottle. So when I always bring my water bottle with me and being one of the sort of zero wasters but you know it's not really a correct term being in Malaysia I always know 
where the water bottle refill stations are like Starbucks or just anywhere I guess I'm always aware of where I can go <laughs> and that's also goes back to exactly what we were saying at the very beginning of how educating yourself empowering yourself with the knowledge but also reaching out and sharing that with your local community and you might be surprised I think one of the the homeworks to do for this Utopia talks afterwards is just if you are inspired to get involved in the space of saying no to single-use plastic. You have four and well three incredible examples of speakers involved in the space. They each have their own incredible projects and movements to get involved in. I'm I'm wrapping up the panel discussion, but we do have time uh, for a couple of questions. I will now liaison to our team at Utopia to invite a participant on. Esther, do you want to guide us through this process or let us know how we'll be moving or inviting someone? Yes, for sure. Hi everyone, there's a voice here coming in from the Utopian team. I'd like, I can see there are a lot of Utopians here who have asked their questions. I'd like to actually ask Nadila Mutia, I think, she has a great question about how we can address this issue in the traditional markets, specifically in the context of Indonesia. Yeah. If that's all right, I will unmute Nadila. Let me just find here, find her here and also ask her to turn on her video. Thank you so much, Esta. I'm so excited. Hi, Nadila. How are you? Um, we're very excited to hear your question. Can you hear us? Yeah. How are you? Hi. Hi, Nadila. Hi. Hi. How are you? Very well. Nadila, do you want to um, introduce yourself and ask us, our panelists, your question? Okay. Uh, my name is Nadila Mutia. I'm from Bali, uh, officially from Singaraja. And, and recently, my, I attend my mother to go to traditional market to buy something. And then um, I still see some, uh, a lot of people use, uh, still use a plastic bag to grab their stuff. So I think um, we should do uh, some change to uh, reduce a, a plastic bag. So what can we do uh, about this problem? Thank you so much, Nadilla. It's so awesome that we can interact with um, our audience. Thank you so much. Who wants to address that question? Tenya, do you want to address it just because you have the Indonesian atmosphere and knowledge? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, yeah, it is something that's still happening, not only in uh, those uh, cities that is not implementing the policy bending, but also happening in Bali and Jakarta, which is already have the policy policy actually. So the solution is two. The first one is we equip the shops or the seller of the traditional market with alternative solutions such as maybe you know the bamboo food containers we call basak in Indonesia. It's actually uh, cheaper and also accessible to them and they can actually sell it to the uh, clients or the shoppers. And the second novel is the one that we need to educate and us to do more is the client or the buyers or us as the community. We need to bring our own containers especially not only uh, reusable bags, but also like a food containers if you want to buy, I see you, you're asking about onions and then um, chilies, stuff like that. So we need uh, small containers that already put inside our bags when we go there. So we don't need any more bags if they're still providing. Thank you so much, Tenya. We're going to try and squeeze one more question in. Esta, the voice behind the Utopia logo. Yeah. Um, we'll let you Hello. bring in our second question. Awesome. Yes, I can uh, see here there's Natasha who asked something about lobbying to governments and how we can do that. I think that's a great question. I'd like to unmute her and let me just quickly find her here. Natasha, if you can unmute yourself and also turn on your video and you can, oh, I'm afraid she has already left actually. That okay. is a shame. Oh, but or do you want to read out what her question was? Sure. She was, uh, she was asking, how can the youth lobby and talk to governments in, enab in enabling policies 
to prevent single use plastic because she thinks that it's hard to, you know, let your voice be heard, especially for, uh, towards the government. Okay. You know. That's a tough question. So we'll, we'll it's, it's, I mean, it's a good question. Obviously we talked about this in our round. So just as a summary, do we all just want to give sort of one input of how we feel the young people have a role of really getting something out of the government? What is a good technique? If you feel like it's challenging, they're not listening to you. How would you advise young people to actually be able to address government? Sure, I'll take that. Um, I think that it definitely can seem scary at first, but it really does come down to thinking big, thinking outside the box, coming up with a creative idea. And with my brother Gary, when we went down the Chitaran River, you know, we, we were two brothers, I was 18, he was 20, thinking that we would make a video and maybe get, you know, a few thousand views here and there. But then we released our videos on social media. So again, finding this amplification tool. And then the next thing you know, four months later, we get a letter from the Minister of the Environment for a full rehabilitation plan of the cleanup. And in February, after going down the expedition, we actually went back to Bandung, back to the Chitaran River, and Indonesian president told us that because of our videos, he was gonna hire 7,000 soldiers to clean up the river, all because we went down the river on plastic bottle kayaks, which honestly, when you think of it, is a very simple idea. And so it really does come down to coming up with a creative idea, thinking big, thinking outside the box, and then hopefully uh, getting your message heard by the government. Amazing. Sydney, what are your two cents? I would say, like uh, Sam said, just do something really out there, something that completely bewilders people that's just totally insane, and you'll grab people's attention and just start a movement. You got to get people educated and you got to get people on board so that you have a big mass to go and just charge at them. And it, it's definitely going to be stressful and it's going to be very hard. It's going to take a very long time, but yeah, you just really have to be very much thinking outside the box. Okay, build a movement, make sure you're being unique, think differently, come onto the table. I'm just going to say it again, come onto the table with a solution. You'll be taken a lot more seriously. Tenya, I know you know this one. What are your thoughts and ideas to address the question? I think we need to give them a fact and data that they cannot turn down because it's something that is so critics and needs to be addressed soon. And I think to be consistent, I think. Because we if, we're only, yeah, if we're only saying that just once and then we go uh, on the other agenda or other sides, it mm. will be not a uh, result. Persistence and commitment is key. I, I love that you are being very persistent and also who you are. Uh, and in the work that you're doing, you say um, data. And obviously that is a huge point that I feel like nobody, I mean, we talk about it, we talk about addressing science, but we're not really following through with it. And I think as activists, we need to be not only educating ourselves, educating others, but really coming onto the table with the facts, with the knowledge of how to move forward, even if it's only a couple steps ahead. So I think, you know, as a, as a, that was a beautiful second question and also last question from the audience. We are running out of time. As a recap, I don't even know where to start. We have three incredible panelists joining us from three different countries all around the world and they've all had a, a journey on their own an adventure um, a movement that they build from the grassroots effort but really explored the different ways on how to communicate effectively to get impact happening in their communities. We talked about how you have to really soak up and become a sponge, learning everything on a local scale, what is happening, who's involved, who doesn't want to be involved. We learned about you know how to go out there, how to be different. Thinking outside the box is very, very important. Ways to get started, we addressed that as well. We learned about how you can, you know, build your team together, how you have to do a mind map. That always helps to write things down. And then sometimes you just have to do it, right? Getting out there, making videos, putting up a YouTube channel, passionately speaking about it, maybe first to your friend, then to your mom and dad, then to your teachers, and next thing you know, you're building a movement. Unfortunately, we do have to close tonight's Utopia Talks. I want to say what a success this has been. I'm really, really grateful for all of you who have signed up, stayed with us during these talks. Uh, Utopia is really trying to build out this movement. This is the first of many webinars and talks that we'll be hosting, discussing world problems and solutions with frontline young change makers as you've seen today. This was a taster, if you're excited, join us next week for our 
panel on racism and environmentalism, as well as World Conservation Day towards the end of this month. We'll be posting more on our Instagram. Please follow utopia.world. To follow Tenya, follow Divers Clean Action. Sydney, thank you for joining us as well with her Sea Monkey project. And last but not least, the only male on our panel accepting all of this female energy. Thank you so much, Sam, for joining us from Make a Change World. Before we all go, I have one last request for all of you joining the participants. You got our contact details in the chat, but what I would like to ask before all of you leave the meeting, if you are willing to, please share your, uh, share your video, unmute yourself. We can do a little bit of a hi, and maybe let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, now we gotta have a nice big smile and we're going to get our team to do screenshots of the, um, I think this is looking so cool. Oh my Whoa, gosh, Hi, everyone. So many. <laughs> so many, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Hi. Turn on your videos, turn on your videos. <laughs> turn on your videos, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Hello, everybody. Please make sure you drop in the comments where, which country you're coming from. I love seeing all of these happy faces. Hi. Thank you everybody for joining Utopia's first Utopia Talks. We're bringing out a lot of different services. We're launching our, our website later this week with a lot of cool things, a lot of cool lineups. So please make sure you follow the movement and um, thank you. Have a beautiful evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks you for having us. Bye. Bye.